You are about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. Anyone remotely interested in the field of ufology will be well aware of Rendlesham and the infamous incidents alleged to have occurred over that Christmas in 1980. Yet this is the tip of the iceberg. The whole area has a reputation for strangeness across a number of fields, and most of these were catalogued by Brenda Butler. Now in an updated version of her 1983 book Sky Crash, co-authored with Philip Kinsella, who joins me to discuss his experiences both inside and outside of Rendlesham Forest. But before that, as always, you can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, guaranteed early releases, bonus content, and more. You can also click the link in the show notes as usual. Mysteries and Monsters is on all social media platforms, and please subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. You can also visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for episodes, merchandise, and news. Thank you as always to Dean Bestor for his marvellous artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. So, let us return to Rendlesham but perhaps not in a way that you would expect. To many, simply mentioning Rendlesham Forest immediately invokes the most controversial UFO incident in UK history. Yet, Rendlesham has had a long history of strangeness that bookends the events of that Christmas in 1980. A chance encounter whilst visiting Rendlesham Forest saw Philip Kinsella meet Benenda Butler, and the bubble of strangeness enveloped them both from that point onwards. Philip, I am delighted to welcome you finally to Mysteries and Monsters in full. Thank you very much, Paul. It's an honour to be back on your show again. I'm really, really very grateful. First of all, how are we? How's Ronnie? How's the family? Everything all going? Yes, everything's all fine. My brother is um, doing his artwork. His, uh, he uses the Centique software now. He used to do conventional artwork, but has, uh, now it's all digital. And uh, he starts all that from scratch, so it's a long process. And, yeah, um, working on other projects myself, so keeping, keeping busy. Good, good. Philip, as, as, as I touched on in the introduction, I think I kind of do you a bit of a disservice because you're a, you're of a very similar vintage to myself. Mm-hmm. So when I was reading the introduction into this new and updated version of Sky Crash, I had to chuckle to myself because I remember seeing that News of the World front page back in 1983 as a wide-eyed 11 year old, hot on the presses of some of the stories that I'd seen at the end of the 70s and regarding poltergeists and other strange things. So it seemed like we were in a a real exciting period for anybody that loved the strange. But you are one of those people that has managed to straddle personal experience to become an author, an investigator, a researcher. Do you think it's one of those things that this was always meant to be that you would find yourself in this position that you are today? Well, Paul, that is a very good question. And I think it applies to a lot of us. I think there are certain elements of synchronicity that starts to pan out. And this uh, tells us that uh, to some degree, there seems to be order to it. And I think that, you know, most scientists in the world would uh, consider that most things are all chaotic. But I beg to differ. So, yes, I do remember reading the front pages of the national newspapers, the event that unfolded within Rendlesham Forest back in 1980. And I remembered being in a field um, and, and holding the newspaper because I was a reader. I loved to read everything I could get my hands on. Absolutely, totally gobsmacked that the military had, well, the American military, uh, of course, in England, in Rendlesham, at Bentwaters and Woodbridge, uh, most notably Bentwaters, had, because uh, one base was the British and one was the Americans, um, had witnessed this, this UFO and, and I couldn't believe it. And then, of course, years later, finding myself actually in the forest 
and doing 10 years of research there. And not only that, but other events start to unfold that become even stranger. So, you know, when you get involved in ufology, a lot of researchers are right. It's like going down the rabbit hole. And when you go down, you go down good and deep. <laughs> and I found myself going even <laughs> deeper than I would like to have gone. So that was really um, uh, quite strange um, in a good way, um, I think, because I never, ever would have dreamed that I would get involved um, in a very small way um, with my own investigations, not so much into the 1980 event that happened over the, the uh, winter Christmas period, with the American troops back then, but that I myself would also have these very strange and weird experiences, which brings into the equation of levels of high strangeness and also areas of high strangeness. So, you know, yes, I, I agree with you. I think with all of us, we tend to find that our paths are pushed into certain areas that we at that moment in time don't even consider is uh, important. And then when you take a look back, you say, my goodness me, I can't believe that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> and it did. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, knowing you as as, as well as I, I do, Philip, then yes. for me, it's very interesting because often when people have had personal experiences outside of their own research, not many of them kind of forge a path in that particular discipline. I can think of three or four notable names, Philip, but obviously hearing you speak about your personal experiences as a as a young person mm. is is very intriguing because... It's it's something that when I've spoken to other people uh, on on both sides of the Atlantic in regards to this, some people bottle it up and, and kind of try and push it away. Calvin Parker is a prime example of that mm. um, until it, it it can't be held back any longer and they they embrace it even after what almost forty forty five years with with Calvin. Mm -hmm. Whereas other other people such as Terry Lovelace or, or Whitley oh, yes. Strieber have, have clearly grabbed the bull by the horns and thought what is going on here i need to understand it was that something that you developed from the first initial incidents that you personally had philip or was it something that you had an interest and it kind of began to run parallel well i for one didn't want anything to do with the ufo uh, field of investigations or indeed the psychic uh, level as well which i i've spent a lot of years researching i think that when you are touched by this singularity then it changes you and i wanted the truth so what occurred was that um, my twin brother and myself had a very strange experience with our maternal grandmother um, when we were young, um, and it was to do with the silver orb that came in broad daylight over, they had a big house, and we couldn't understand what it was, and it came so low, it, it hung above our grandmother's head, or because their property was three stories high, and we assumed, we, we kind of like saw, assumed that it was roughly around about the height of the second floor to the windows there, but it was above our grandmother's head. So that then propelled us to look into this. And I used to go to the uh, library every Saturday. I remembered also a teacher, a very lovely man called Mr. Charles at Stockwood High School because we uh, lived in Luton. Of course, my grandparents lived in Felton Middlesex. Um, and the Mr. Charles was very much interested in this. And of course, you have to remember that back in the day, uh, we're talking about the um, uh, 1980s here, early 1980s. Um, you couldn't talk about UFOs or psychic phenomena without people taking the mickey out of you. So I think and feel that the inception of that started the ball rolling for me. It wasn't like at that point that I wanted to come out to the public and say, oh, I've, I've seen a UFO at close, uh, close range. Indeed, some of the experiences that we've had have been at very close range and they were huge. But it was the experience, the abduction or so-called abduction that occurred in the winter of 1989 with myself that occurred in the village of Marston where I had an experience um, and there were two parts to this experience. One part was physical, the other part was an, occurred in a non-physical state of reality, although I was very much aware of what's going on. I'm not going to go into detail because I will be here all night talking about <laughs> it, but I had physical marks. So what I did at that point was that even then in 1989, it was hard to reach out to people. I know that we contacted Jenny Randalls and she was very kind. She phoned us at one point. I can't even remember what the conversation was about. <laughs> I think it was about twins and psychic phenomena and the UFO yes. thing. Um, 
But then it was years later when I joined a UFO group that things started to really roll for me because I had this in, in, intent, this need to find the truth. I, as you know, Paul, am very grounded. I'm very guarded. Um, I, I don't, you know, uh, run off with the fairies. I wanted the truth. And I'm not a scientist. I'm not, I, don't, I don't consider myself to be a scientist in any means of the word. But this is why I think that the, this need to find the truth. And even to this point now, within this time, Pierre Sabak, another researcher, a brilliant researcher, has, I, I, because I wanted to find out what it was that actually occurred to me in the winter of 1989. And, and, and it, I've never let go of that. So Pierre Sabak has actually done, I haven't had the report yet, but we're, we're working towards a new analysis with regards to the abduction phenomena. And he's done, I think, about 60 or 70 page analysis of that that I will have that is going into another UFO book that I'm going to be working on. So there was this need to come out and tell people that, you know, I want to know what this is. People call it an alien abduction. Okay, that's fine. But I wanted to find out if there was more linked to this than just the so-called Hollywood version of aliens kidnapping humans and abducting them and doing all sorts of experiments on them. There, there was obviously a very uh, greater part that I think and feel that we had missed um, and are still missing to a degree with regards to the phenomena at large. So, and, and people will say, oh, you know, you, you, you brought this all out because you wanted to be famous and known. Well, I'm not famous and I'm not known. And I will tell you, I haven't made much money from it at all, only from the sales of the books. And people then criticize you for that. <laughs> but my argument is, it's a passion and a drive. Scientists write journals, they write books, they inform the public of their research and their work. So in a, a you know, in a long way, <laughs> this answers your question. Um, you are touched by the singularity and it changes you. Mm. I've always found it interesting when I've heard you mention that incident with your grandmother, that didn't she sort of say, oh, well, it's the fairies that have come yes. to look at you? Yeah, she, we asked her what it was, and she said, she said the fairies had come to take a closer look at us. And, of course, at that point, we realized that there were no such things as – well, I mean, there was fairy law, and there could possibly well be. But in this present time, we knew that that object was not linked to fairies. And I think what she was doing was cushioning the blow of shock for us. But do you know what, Paul? She was not even phased by it. Hmm. I remembered that night because I used to have the attic room uh, right upstairs when you went into their large hall you went up a winding staircase and at night i remembered that my grandmother was talking to someone on the phone and the, the phone was on the telephone table with a seat you know the old-fashioned ones and she was sitting there talking to someone i remembered creeping out she was telling a member of the family what had happened and i then realized that it was quite serious but of course uh, it just faded into oblivion the experience didn't but no one really mentioned it because no one really wanted to talk about it <laughs> Yes. Well, as as is generally the case in a lot of phenomena, Philip. Yes, that's right. Yes. And, and it's interesting because our last, I'm not jumping the gun here, but we haven't had any experiences other than the last one, which was on the 9th of April 2016 at 11.15 p.m. at night. Now, that was spectacular. And still, we're left with question marks. You know, the phenomena eludes us continuously. Um, and even comes with levels of high strangeness because on that last um, experience that we had that had been tracked, and this is all in the new book that's coming out, I'll explain that later, um, it, there was a level of high strangeness where there was no one in their cars, there was no one walking down our street from the pub or walking the dog. It, it was just absolutely strange. So I think and feel that, you know, to some degree, um, when you are touched by this phenomena, then you yourself seem to be a magnet. And I know it doesn't fare very well when someone says, oh, they, they're an experiencer or a contactee or an abductee, and now they're a researcher. But at least I can say that I've been in the nest of the activity. And although I'm still left scratching my head, the only thing I have are theoretical models uh, that I've been working on to try and work out exactly what's going on. Well, I think that's what's always struck me about your work and, and the way you carry yourself, Philip, is that you are more interested in the why rather than the what in regards to not sort of accepting the, the general consensus of what is going on and and why these 
encounters seem to be happening to certain people, you want to understand, well, if that's the case, why is this happening? And why is it happening to me rather than just sort of accepting some people's perceptions or the explanations that are often put forward? Uh, without, as you say, we could be here all night if we try to look at every version of the theory that people put forward in regards to what's going on and mm. who's doing what and why they're doing it and how long it's been going on for. We could, it, it, you, yeah. you, you could break it down to the real minutiae of, of the whole abductee, contactee situation regardless. So I've always been very taken by the fact that you're just trying to sort of understand it on a, on a larger scale rather than just accepting. Oh, yes, absolutely. And and peeling away um, bit behind the mask of what's really going on. I mean, you know, I'm very much a thinker like many other people. I think, I think, I think, I think all the time. And I, you try to look at things practically speaking. We have to differentiate fact from fiction. We have to try to create some kind of platform where we're able to uh, put certain patterns and pieces together. So certainly... I, I am a person who likes to, to dismantle things and bring them back together again, but not the way that it had firstly been presented. Mm. Um, like a smoke screen, you have to get past the smoke to try and find out what's behind it. So, yes, I have never accepted, I think, to a degree, um, the fact that we are dealing with some kind of um, force or intelligence that's coming from another planet. I think more, I'm not saying that there aren't species out there that, that aren't coming from other worlds. I'm absolutely convinced there are, but this, um, so-called, uh, alien abduction, there are two parts to it. One is physical, one is non-physical. And that's the difficulty in trying to put the pieces together because uh, the phenomena eludes us continuously. But because I went through the experience that I had, um, I wanted to know why it happened and why it was that that, you know, I, of all people, had gone through that experience like many other people. So looking into the psychological factors through consciousness and then now into the interdimensional hypothesis, uh, which is very interesting. But I, I can assure you that I, I, it, it just is fascinating. Um, I'm not really interested in, in what happened to me now. I've, I've kind of come to accept that. But it's now good that other researchers have, have kind of like helping me to try and look even deeper. I mean, I wouldn't mind if someone said to me, you know, oh, it's something completely different that's related to UFOs, but it appeared in this way. I'd be happy with that. But I, I wanted to know what it was that occurred and why it happened and what forces were behind or intelligences were behind this uh, experience. So, yes, I, I, I kind of like can't leave things alone. <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to dig in and dig deep and, you know, and and um, I, like a lot of other people, good researchers out there, I'm not the one that's, 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 you know, batting for pole position and holding up the accolade to say, I have found the secret, I've got it. <laughs> I'm not like that. I've always shared information and um, connected with other researchers. But certainly, yes, I, I would consider that I can't leave things alone. <laughs> I'm a bit of an interferer, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes that's a good thing, good problem to have, Philip, I think. Yes, I get <laughs> into trouble sometimes, I can assure you. <laughs> as, as you touched on there, I've been very impressed with several people that I've met over the last few years in regards to the whole kind of presumption about anybody working in strange phenomena is that people tend to to hold things in a lot and i've noticed recently like as i say since i've been doing this show that quite a lot of people that i've met especially in the uk philip are very generous and yes are happy to share their information and ask for other opinions rather than holding it all in and wanting it to be their case um, I know, as you touched on in, in Sky Crash, which we'll dive into shortly. Yes. Obviously, Malcolm Robinson was very considerate in, in lending you a lot of his research in regards to what he'd done. And obviously, yeah, mutual friend Philip is Mantle is someone that's constantly sharing things. And, and Paul Sinclair is another oh, one yes. who's very happy to... Dear to, friends. Yeah, and, and it's amazing how short the relationships have become for me over these last few years where I've got to know more and more people and it's just like a snowball, Philip, as I'm sure you're very aware of. Yeah. So is that something that you think has improved dramatically? Because obviously you kind of set foot into the sort of the, the wider world of UFOlogy in the mid-90s. Have you noticed it become a more 
productive and positive experience over here or do you think it's just the same good people were still doing the same good things that they were doing 30 years ago? Well, I think that the certain attitudes within ufology have changed and you will always have a divide of opinion. That happens in all walks of life. You'll have one side that um, doesn't like another side. That That is human behavior. I think that the... Um, the way that I see it with regards to researchers is that there has been a change in the way that we're viewing the phenomena now, and not so much as but nuts and bolts related. I always say that it's very dangerous to put yourself in a corner. You get some people who will tell you how it is and what it is. You'll have some people telling you what high command that certain reptilians are linked with. And I, I have to say, uh, you know, all, all hats off to them, but you know, we're still trying to work out what the UFO is, what it represents it, where it comes from. Now, there are divides of opinions, and you have to be careful with certain um, levels of research because you don't want to spill all the beans straight away until, of course, you've got it printed or documented because you'll find that some people will take that information and use it for themselves. Uh, I know that good old Paul, bless him, Paul Sinclair, uh, a dear friend, wonderful man, a brilliant researcher and author, he himself um, has gone through the same thing. Um, so I think and feel that by connecting with those individuals that you feel safe and comfortable with is what's key. Uh, and I think that's quite easy to find um, with regards to the help and the sharing of information that we do with one another. Um, as I said, you know, I, I'm so honored to be linked also with America and with brilliant researchers over there um, as well. So I think that attitudes have changed and people are now beginning to be more um, understanding or accepting as opposed to divided. Um, and, I, and I have seen that, Paul, myself, with where your beliefs into the phenomena, mine certainly have changed and morphed over the years. When I was younger, I thought the whole thing was nuts and bolts. They were coming from another planet or whatever. But now there's a lot of other key factors, theoretical factors that we have to take into consideration. My argument is, you will <laughs> laugh at this, where are the aliens where are they? Mm. The UFOs are present. They're acknowledged. That is fact. The alien presence is also acknowledged. That is fact. But we have to answer that one million dollar question. Where exactly are they? And take away the the fake footage of CGI footage on YouTube and other platforms. You know, there are some, uh, I think, some genuine, some very rare genuine cases of something that's been caught. Um, but I, I think and feel that, you know, there are some people who want a case for themselves and they want the full glory for it. And dare you step onto anyone's toes, <laughs> not that you're intending to. Um, but, you know, it's like Roswell, given an example. <laughs> My argument has always been that, you know, I believe that something extraordinary did crash there. So extraordinary, in fact, that the um, the army at that point, um, who had been informed by Mac Brazel of the debris or parts of the debris that had been found from this object, when the newspapers released the story that a flying disc was now in the possession of the uh, the army and then changed it then to a, it was just a weather balloon, well, it was that secret that no one was out looking for it. You know, if you have a top secret experimental device, you make, you'll certainly make sure that you're, you're, you're knowing where it is and when yes. it comes down. <laughs> you would hope. So uh, they, they did a good job in pulling the wool over the eyes until Stanton <laughs> Friedman, of course, good old, the late Stanton Friedman started to, uh, you know, dig into the files and find his connection <laughs> links. But, you know, I think that, you know, I, I'm glad that we're linked with a, a good comradeship with a lot of researchers. And I think, you know, we we just tend to roll our eyes and look the other way if someone is not agreeing with something that you're talking about. That will inevitably, invariably happen. <laughs> Best way to be, Philip. Best yes, way to be. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now, one would have to say, after everything we've 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 looked at and, and and covered there, why on earth would anybody want to sort of dive into Rendlesham as we've just <laughs> just said yes. about the strands and the characters and mm. the varying stories this is an ant's nest Philip. Mm. regardless of whichever angle you come at it from it will bite you whichever <laughs> whether you want it to or not oh yes even when you took those tentative steps in the in the mid 90s and obviously Rendlesham is one of those that 
every time you think it's gone away again, something comes forward, and it and it, com- and it and it and it it seems to reappear from from nowhere. I've been interested in ufology since, as I say, probably forty years now. Mm. Throughout that, and it's been interesting how every so on you think it's gone away, and then it reappears. Something else happens. Notably, I've noticed more over the last ten years when I've taken a more proactive interest in the subject across a variety of fields that I've noticed the 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 strands and the versions that are, are, are running out there now that seems to be so many things. Mm. Did you just want to go and experience the area and just have a look and get a feel for it and then you got bitten by the bug, Philip? Or was this something that you thought, I really want to sort of dig into this. I want to find out what's been going on because, as I said in the introduction, whatever happened that Christmas particular period, the Hill area, as we were talking about places of high strangeness, and obviously we mentioned Paul, uh, who is a prime example of the the, the weird area on the east coast of Yorkshire, not yes. too far from myself. Brendlesham is another area with a long history of all kinds of strange things, from alleged secret military operations not even involving the whole Rendlesham incident to ghosts to black shucks to disappearing people even as we were saying about the fey a history of local fey folklore in that particular area oh yes it's a strange place regardless of everything else that happened at that military base yes absolutely and uh, to answer your question there, Paul, I think that there was a mild curiosity to go there. And this was under the recommendation of another dear um, uh, American researcher um, who told us, please go out there and, and check it out and see what's still going on out there. So me, my twin brother and a good friend, Susan, did just that. We were classed like the Scooby-Doo gang if there was something <laughs> that would tell us to go. And, you know, I'll tell you something very strange as well. J- joking aside... When we had come back on one occasion, me and Susan ourselves on one occasion, on one particular occasion, we had actually seen a mock of the Scooby-Doo van driving <laughs> through the forest. No word of a lie. That's what <laughs> happened. It was exactly, you know, the, the um, mystery machine? Yes. The, the van was exactly like, with all of the stuff, it was a re- replica. We <laughs> thought that was very bizarre. And that, as God is my witness, if you could get a way of getting into my head and seeing it, you would see it. So... It was more of a under recommendation. But then, of course, what happened was that we began to realize that there was still strange uh, activity occurring there. Obviously, uh, over the 10 year period that we did our research, not every time we went there that th- things would happen. But certainly um, light phenomena, military helicopters, we had experienced that meeting Brenda Butler in there. I didn't know where Brenda Butler was in the world. I knew that she was the co-author to Sky Crash, a cosmic conspiracy that had been published by Neville Spearman, limited in 1984, along with Jenny Randalls and Dot Street. I, I knew that, but I didn't know where she was in the world. And you can imagine my shock when on one particular night that Susan, myself and my brother Ronald went there, I got out of the car and I said, uh, as it started to get uh, started to get dark, I really would like to meet Brenda Butler. And that very night, that is exactly who I met in the forest. Talk about synchronicity. And what happened was that we didn't have any success with anything strange occurring that night in the forest, but we saw this strange light activity in a copse of woods. So, well, it's all forest anyway, but it was like flashing lights and this strange music. And we <laughs> thought, my goodness, there's a UFO there. And of course it wasn't. And as we got closer, there was a lady with a white German shepherd, another gentleman that was there, um, and as we walked past, I realized that they were trying to take pictures of something with their camera and they were using this music to entice whatever it was they were trying to bring forth. As I worked, Walk past along with Susan and Ronnie. The lady stood up a little bit guarded, which anyone would do if there's, uh, you know, new people around. And we said, good, good, good. E-. We said, good evening, although it was night. She said, good evening. And as I went 
forward, this feeling overcame me. And it, w it was strange. It was like, you need to go back and you need to speak to that lady. So I stopped and I went back and they were continuing their work. And I said, are you looking for the orbs? And the lady said, the lady said yes, why? And I said, well, I was rather hoping to meet Brenda Butler. And she said, my dear, I am Brenda Butler. <laughs> then what happened was that she and the, the gentleman – um, they showed us on this video camera these images of this grey type thing in camouflage, but it was like a light source around it moving through the forest. And they continued to show us this over and over again, and we were excited. And, of course, that then built that connection between Brenda Butler and myself, although, you know, we... we we collaborated so much in a lot of work that she was very gracious. She's a very gracious lady, and I call her the guardian of the forest because she uh, was responsible to a degree of, of being, uh, you know, instrumental not only in the 1980 event that occurred with the American troops back then over the Christmas period, but obviously she was connected with a lot of the American servicemen and women during that time and ran ghost hunting expeditions, yes. UFO reporting uh, system that she was trying to juggle on top of, you know, having a family. So she has to be admired and respected. And I had no idea at all that she would be in that forest. And of course, these levels of high strangeness began when um, we had our own amazing uh, experience that was an experiment that we had performed back on the 8th of June 1998 within the forest. We had actually summoned a UFO, and that was now what they would call a CE5 initiative. Hmm. And most people will say, don't believe it. Well, don't believe it, but I can assure you that's exactly what happened to us at that point. And so we had been bitten by the bug incredibly and you know people talk about Rendlesham well it's the 1980 event I have met Colonel Charles Holt he's he is an esteemed gentleman David Young organized a conference and he had us go for a meal with him afterwards he's a charming gentleman and a charming man and um, he told us what happened to him and his men and um, it, it's just incredible um, you know but yes uh, unfortunately when you get a celebrated UFO case you are then seen to be jumping on the bandwagon. Not that there was any intention to jump on that bandwagon at all, because during the 90s, you know, everyone knew about the 1980 event and that was it. And there was very little in the way of other than that that was circulating within the media. And of course, now, as we, we discuss, there is so much more information and experiences coming through from other people. So, you know, you're caught between the pillar and the deep blue sea with regards to you coming forward and then writing a book, co-authoring a book with the original investigator, Brenda Butler, Sky Crash Throughout Time, and people point the finger and say, oh, you're just in it for the money. And it's like, no, we're not. So I'd, I'd just like to clarify that point. <laughs> <laughs> in, your, in my defense, Your Honor. <laughs> In my defence. <laughs> Duly noted. Duly noted. I mean, I think Brenda's one of those people that, unless you know a fair bit about British ufology, Philip, most people don't know about her because Brenda's one of those people. She's a very boots-on-the-ground kind of researcher. She does oh, yes. local lectures and she's she shares a lot of information with other researchers and she takes people on tours around the area and, and, and such like. Or she certainly used to. Yes. But she's not what one would say is a prolific author, because as, other, other than Sky Crash, she's not really published much in regards to the body of work that she's collated over the years, which is a, a, a vast amount of involvement in this field. I mean, obviously, she ran a subscription magazine. As you say, she did ghost hunts and she had a paranormal investigation unit because the, the people were seeing strange things all over the place it was yes. a weird place yes. outside of everything else and yet there are so many other aspects of brenda's life with with the fact that her and dot were breaking into the, oh yes to, to the military base yes you know and and surreptitiously recording halt when they when they managed to get hold of the memo I think Brenda was one of the key drivers in getting this story out there and here we are 40 years later i think it, it's surprising to me how often this happens, Philip, that often the people that drive it yes. at the initial point... Yes, absolutely, yeah. ...get lost in the sort of 
re-evaluation or re-investigations. And when we look back, obviously you had Dot, Jenny and Brenda all working on this, along with Harry Harris, I, I oh, think, yes. as well, who was a, 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 a well, a well-renowned journalist at that particular time. And it's interesting when everybody looks back now. I don't think if you ask most people who had a passing interest, unless they were had an encyclopedic knowledge or a real, they'd been involved in it to some extent, Philip, they would probably not know any of those four names, which I find remarkable, especially when you're talking about Jenny Randalls. Yes, well, Jenny Randalls, as everyone knows, was one of the prime members within ufology. She was linked with Bifora, and uh, she has to be respected because I think she she published more than 40 books on UFOs and psychic phenomena. Um, But it was actually Brenda and Dot who wanted to actually write this book and to put the pieces together because Brenda was in touch with her informants on the base that started to reveal certain aspects of that night question surrounding 1980, the Christmas period, the three-night period of the uh, so-called UFO activity. And I must stress for everyone here right now, for those ardent, ardent disbelievers out there, when you're in that forest, there has been suggestions that it was nothing less than lights from the Orphanus Lighthouse. Let me tell you, it was not, because we had seen that in action. And if our American military, God bless them, were chasing nothing less than lights to the, the lighthouse, then God help us, all of us, because we'll be in trouble. But going back to um, Brenda, yes, she had been instrumental in writing the book, and along with Dot, I think Brenda uh, did a lot more of the material, and Jenny Randalls, because Jenny Randalls then had her sources. Of course, Jenny Randalls, uh, you know, new publishers, and she was trying to set a deal up for their book, Sky Crash, A Cosmic Conspiracy. Now, what's interesting is that Brenda had documented many events long before that period in a redundant manuscript called Life on the Move. And um, and Brenda did want the book to be called Life on the Move. And I had to gently say to her that you can't have a book called Life on the Move with regards to UFOs because you need something that's punchy. Otherwise, people won't know what the book's about. You know what I mean? Um, but she had this wealth of information. And uh, I, you have to understand that Brenda is very guarded. I mean, I love her to death because she's very strong. She do- doesn't suffer fools gladly. She's very wary of people, rightfully so. Um, but she trusted me to have a copy of her manuscript. And when I started going through the manuscript, I found out that there was a lot of other levels of high strangeness, one of which um, takes up four chapters of Sky Crash throughout time, which concerned a so-called reptilian man. Now, I know people will reel back in shock and horror and say this is absolutely ridiculous, but let me tell you, Paul, that that is actual fact, because this... um, so-called reptilian man may have also infiltrated me, my brother and Susan, long before I met Brenda Butler. And when we had gone on an expedition with the UFO group to check out Rendlesham Forest itself through the strange man that we met. And, um, and then finding out years later that Brenda had met with key members of the UFO community. She even had a meeting with Lord Admiral Hill Norton of the fleet. And not only that, Brenda's very black and white she's very laid back i mean you know she could meet that she could have met the queen and it was like to her it's just someone else yes. <laughs> she's 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 and i do admire her and her strength and the way that you know she's very black and white about things but that book that we co-authored eventually um that did mold into sky crash uh, throughout time went through quite a difficult time itself um when we were trying to source a publisher uh, the publishing company that took it originally was Capelbaum publishing limited uh, john day was a dear man a wonderful guy who published several of my other books before this one came out mm. but you see unfortunately the book didn't do very well because the publishers were speeding out other authors books like there's no tomorrow and of course you have to try and do your own research but what i uh, in research into getting the book out there and trying to advertise it but what i found um incredible was that it felt like the book wanted to be buried or that there were certain people who wanted to bury it they didn't want it to get out there mm. and i'm not saying that the book had anything that was in terms of revelation um regarding the the events that led up to the 1980 event before and afterwards but i thought it was very strange so it was philip mantle 
um, who did hold out that mantle, and I've got to say that with a little bit of a joke because we do call him uh, <laughs> Philip Mantle. He's UFO royalty. He said to me, um, you know, would you mind if I reprinted the book? And I said, hey, Philip, I mean, that absolutely, if you want to bring it out, because we had the rights back from the publishers, from its initial publication in 2013. And then, of course, it came out, was it last year? I think it yes. was last year. They really, Philip really released it with mm-hmm. new pictures, diagrams, and all sorts of things that we could do it. And so, yeah, it, it was down to Brenda who really was sitting on a gold mine, even to the point where she allowed, I mean, I've been out with her in the forest and stones have fallen down from the sky that were hot, uh, some kind of poltergeist activity. I mean, she's incredible. But she even let me hold this strange honeycomb material that was actually the residue that had been dripped from the initial craft that Colonel Charles Holt had seen when he saw the what he cons- he thought was some kind of big eye that was dripping molten onto the ground that was part within the UFO activity that occurred. And I so I've been very honoured and privileged to have been able to look at her book, look at her research, and connect with some of the people because a lot of the people that were involved in that are now deceased. Mm. Um, that, that are certainly those that are connected with Brenda and during the time of David Daniels, um, who was known as the reptilian man, yes. even connecting with Ralph Noyes, former Ministry of Defense, that went on to write a science fiction book called A Secret Prophet. I have a copy of that book. Mm. So you'll, you'll find that, yes, um, when you start looking into certain hotspots or geographical locations where UFOs have been seen, like Paul Sinclair in Bempton doing his research and uh, very much looking forward to his Wolfland's new documentary coming out, yes. you'll find, as, as with Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, certainly not unique, but you'll find that there are areas – that promote these levels of high strangeness. And that is what we were trying to fathom um, in terms of, of, of what was going on. And I was shocked, I have to say here very quickly, at the amount of accounts that Brenda had recorded before the 1980 events. Yes. So everyone was saying, oh, yes, it's just that that's all that happened. But no, there was a, a hell of a lot more that was occurring and had occurred before and after the initial 1980 event. It's almost as if it, everyone packed up and left and that was it. <laughs> and I think that's probably why um, Brenda was, you know, religiously doing her research and documentation, photo- photography, or taking people out on tours. She never stopped, but people didn't see that. They didn't hear about that. So I think that, um, unfortunately, there was a divide of opinions with regards to Jenny Randall's and her view on the Rendlesham case. She's res- she has to be honored and respected for her decision. And, and I think Dot Street, you know, that she still connects with Brenda. So, yes, it's very sad that, that you know, one of the key players – was not so much forgotten, but, you know, kind of like pushed to one side. It it is one of those odd things about this. And as as you touched on there, there are uh, two aspects I want to dive into a little bit further. The the interesting thing, as you were saying about when when your book came out, Philip, was the, the parallels with what happened to the original publication because there were all kinds of weird things going on with that. Like the the publisher lost a thousand copies that suddenly reappeared a month after the book had been released. Oh yes. And, uh, and I think somebody in Japan had got hold of the manuscript and published it. And so nobody was getting any money from it, but it was selling like hotcakes over there. There were strange things going on in that aspect. So to then 20 years, 30 years later, look at revisiting it again and then having strange issues again yes. around the book. It it does make you stra- scratch your head because, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, Philip, when we're dealing with these particular kind of subjects, you tend to ignore coincidence when things like that occur, especially when it's the same thing. Yes, and I always likened it to any UFO case when it's in its prime uh, stage of development 
or when it's just been experienced, you'll find that not a lot of people want to get interested in it. And like a good fine bottle of red wine, when it's left <laughs> for many years to mature, then everyone wants to just to try a drop of it or they want a piece of it. <laughs> now, I think that looking into the original publication of Sky Crash, A Cosmic Conspiracy, must be heralded through the efforts of Neville Spearman mm. and, of course, his company that wanted to release the book. But yes, there were a lot of copies that were hidden of all places in an Ottoman. Yes. And, yes, <laughs> and we, Brenda and Dot and Jenny couldn't work out what was going on. They felt that there was a higher establishment that didn't want the story to break. Of course, we're all aware of the release of the um, article that appeared. I think it was the news of the world, if I'm right. I may be wrong. News yep. of the world. Yes, it was. One of them, it, it, the story came out there or broken that aliens had been seen um, um, you know, <laughs> I'm not so certain about that. That, that didn't come into the, the equation at all. But you know what the press are like and how some people can fabricate certain events. But <laughs> it did feel to the ladies that when their original book came out, that it would, they were having a hard time with it. And then, of course, all these years later, in 2013, well, most certainly 2011 and, 11 and 12, when I had been putting the pieces to the book together with the help of Brenda Butler, writing the book, getting it structured, then finding that I was uh, having difficulty with certain um, individuals that I won't name and finding it very difficult to try and get the book out there. It almost as if the book was cursed. <laughs> and, I, and I did joke and think to myself that here we go again. This is a, a, a continued repeat of what happened to the first book that was, that was brought out. Now, I'm not saying I think that A Cosmic Conspiracy, uh, Sky Crash A Cosmic Conspiracy, the first book, was a, a wonderful piece of book work. Absolutely brilliant. And, and to my mind, this new book is different in the sense that we're not going into the real structuring of the 1980 event. We're looking at experiences that happened before and afterwards and touching a little bit on the major event that occurred. So yes, it was like history repeating itself. And I just found it really, really hard because I, I we were barraged by a lot of criticism from people stating that, you know, what a load of rubbish and, and so on and so forth. And people are entitled to their opinion. But you'll find that we had to change the subtitle to the book from the original subtitle, because I think that people that bought this book, the original book that was published by Capital Band in 2013, thought that it was all about the 1980 event. Mm. And when they opened it and read it, they realized that it was to do with Brenda and her research. And, of course, our research as well, along with a lot of a few theoretical ideas thrown. So, yes, we did find very difficult that it, it was almost like it, it was to bury it and as i said you know when you have a celebrated ufo event that occurs you'll get certain key individuals who want status that they want to own it it's almost like they're copywriting it and that you have no right to invade into uh, evade into that territory or evade their territory as it were mm. but you know i'm just an ordinary guy like most other people that had a vested interest then that was hooked by it through an experiment, experiment that we performed that categorically proved that the phenomena seems to connect with our human psyche or consciousness to some degree. And by stating that, we have to understand that most of the men, the military men, that were involved with the UFOs that were seen during the Christmas night period, three-night period over Rendlesham, that they had alternative experiences. And this is why I think the phenomena seems to integrate itself on a very um, deep level, on an individual level, with the, the participant that is going through the experience. Um, so, yes, uh, at least, you know, I was able to formulate that conclusion at some point. <laughs> I mean, the other character, as you've also mentioned there, Philip, that made me raise my eyebrows, not because I was surprised about the explanation as to who or what this particular character was. Mm, but it's yes. this kind of Malkovechian behaviour by this individual who seemed to be oh, yes. interfering with people all over the place as though he was... I'm not sure if muddying the water would be the right word. It was it was almost as if he would he would give one part truth to three parts false. Yes, absolutely. And I'll tell you something about that. When before I got involved in Rendlesham, I had belonged to UFO Group and met a wonderful researcher, Peter Robbins, great man. Of course, we're not going to go into the story of what happened with him. Mm. 
Um, very sad, but he's got through that period now. He is a brilliant researcher. His re- research is, is absolutely incredible. Not only with, he worked with Bod Hopkins and, uh, he's, he knows the work of Wilhelm Reich and many other researchers yes. work as well. But we had gone with this UFO group to do a sky watch and we had gone to Rendlesham. I can't even remember the name of the pub that we went to to get something to eat and drink. And it was not alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> At least that doesn't fare very well if you're out looking for UFOs, <laughs> <No>. you know. <laughs> um, but um, one of the things that really fascinated me was that when we walked, me, Ronnie and Susan walked into this pub and there was many others in this minibus, we sat down and this man made a beeline for us. Um, he looked like he was from, like, he, he, I suppose he was, a, you would consider him to be a handsome guy. He had a party in the middle with slightly blondish hair. He wore some, you know, ordinary clothing. But Ronnie and Susan said that his right arm had changed to that of plastic and back again. And they were quite alarmed by this. But this guy seemed to get in your head. He seemed to want to know everything about you. And then when we left the meal to go into the forest, he then got in his car and followed us into the forest and followed me, Ronnie and Susan, getting into our heads again and again and again. His name was Joseph, or at least he called himself Joseph. And when he eventually decided to go, because we wanted rid of him, I thought, God, this guy is getting into my head. He's crazy, whatever. Mm -hmm. He was the talk of everyone on that minibus going back to uh, Bedford. Now, years roll on years later, I meet Brenda, and then in Brenda's manuscript, she has this guy called David Daniels, who uh, allegedly was some kind of reptilian. He actually did some very strange things. He could read people's minds correctly. He did. He seemed to be in looking for something, but no one knows exactly what he was looking for. Most people would consider him to be mad. But he did reveal himself, apparently, to Brenda in his true form. And he did some really incredible things, even to the point, and I have to state here, that Ralph Noyes, um, who uh, was uh, connected with the Ministry of Defense, David Daniels had taken Ralph Noyes onto a bridge not far from a television studio, raised his arms up into the air, and immediately three uh, circular UFOs appeared in triangular formation in the sky. And uh, Ralph Noyes kind of liked the guy. He, he did state that there was, seemed to be a slightly unnervingness to this person. But even to the point where David Daniels had secured a meeting with Lord Admiral Hill Norton in London with Brenda Butler. Now, we're talking about, you know, a guy that no one knows anything about, has got no real roots. They, you know, he claimed to have been from uh, another star system, that it was here on a mission. He had no interest in Rendlesham whatsoever in the events that led up. And this was just after Brenda's book had been published. And they'd actually had this meeting with Lord Admiral Hill Norton and uh, David Daniels was talking to um, Lord Admiral Hill Norton about his plight and his people. And Lord Admiral Hill Norton, while Brenda was sitting there listening, was saying, I can't help you. My hands are tied. I'm coming up to retirement. And when Brenda pushed over a copy of Sky Crash to him, um, their book, A Cosmic Conspiracy, Lord Admiral Hill Norton pushed the book back and said, if that's got anything to do with the Americans, I want nothing to do with it. And so it was all very strange. And of course, this, this, this thing or this, this alien, if you want, for want of a better word, then got to America and got in as Father Daniels to, to see in a prison to see Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens. And this was absolutely bizarre. So what he was doing was trying to infiltrate certain key members within the UFO community. Now, the last that Brendan heard was at Scotland Yard, and I think it was the CIA or the FBI, I think it was CIA that wanted, wanted him, and he was on the run. And apparently it was all to do with some kind of murder that occurred in a flat with another guy in London, but no new leads were led to this murder at all. So, you know, when when you look at it, and when Brenda looks at it, you know, she liked him, she got on with him, because Brenda would would, would not be faced by anyone. But certainly I agree with you, Paul, this guy was, uh, you know, mad, um, but he displayed these extraordinary psychic abilities, um, incredible levels of intelligence, but then would alternate between a child. Now, there was a case where Brenda had taken him to see another contactee, uh, John Day. 
and um, and immediately now John Day was famous for a, a very well known UFO case that happened here in England. I won't go into detail, yes. but when David Daniels had met John Day, it got really nasty. They seemed to recognise each other and get this from past lives, <laughs> and yeah. And and so, you know, I'm reading this, and the, when I did my research and uh, interviewed, I didn't interview John Day, but interviewed key witnesses too, and who had been connected with David Daniels, there were several shivers that ran down my spine, because these people were not lying. And the documentation and paperwork certainly verified for us that things were very strange. Now, what's even stranger, I'll just add in here for your listeners, is that... <laughs> When I'd gone to Phoenix to to um, go to a UFO conference out there, I wasn't talking. I was watching other luminaries doing their talk. I saw Doc, uh, Jack Vallee do a talk, mm. um, brilliant man, um, met him and shook his hand. And I there was also other uh, researchers there, Kathleen, good old Kathleen Marden, bless her, Stanton Friedman and all the rest of it. But when we had finished... And we were ready to go back to the airport. We were there for about a week. We were in the same um, van as Nick Pope. Hmm. And Nick was kind and cordial. And uh, he, he, he did say some things about Sky Crash that I won't mention here. <laughs> but one of the things that did interest me was that I tried to goad him a little bit about David Daniels. And he looked at me and he said, yes, that was an interesting case, wasn't it? And that's all he said. He didn't say any more. And I thought, well, what does he know about that? What do they know about that? So as you'll find that within any case, with any experience that people have had, most notably this very strange and bizarre experience with David Daniels, it is like going down that rabbit hole again. But one of the disturbing elements to this is that there is almost like a childlike quality to most of these experiences that people have, but kind of like leading into the malicious area. So, uh, you know, that that uh, experience that Brenda had and tying the pieces together and linking them as best that we could indicates that he was either very strange, very gifted or he was indeed what they claimed to be an extraterrestrial. Um, but, you know, I don't know how he pulled that off with meeting L uh, Lord Admiral Hell Norton or getting in as Father Daniels into the prison grounds <laughs> to see Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens. And then, of course, connecting with his daughter, Cece, um, who then started to become very worried about this guy's presence. And I think that uh, it was fact that um, Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens had a private investigator follow him to find out more about this guy. And this is what he did, you see. He would upset people. He would get into your mind. And he, no one knew what he was after, unless, of course, his modus operandi was to feed information from the minds of the individual, collating information. It's possible on a psychic level uh, for something that he wasn't quite clear about in terms of his own agenda. But he just disappeared. But did he? As I said again, this happened back in 1984, the period of 1984, through this period of time, 1985. And we had gone to the forest many years later, and this strange guy turned up. And I know that Brenda will say, no, you didn't meet him, but why not? Is it possible? And I will tell you, I'm not making two and two fit um, here. I'm telling you, I think that was the same individual that used an Elias. His name was Joseph. He called himself Joseph. So there are some very strange things that occur in life. I can assure you when you're starting to divulge into the UFO Department of Study, <laughs> it is incredibly complex and you just have to try and keep your wits about you. But as I said, Paul, when you're interviewing uh, certain individuals, they're looking you in the eye. They are not lying. And certainly the documentation and paper trail that we found that led not only to Chris Pennington, who was then Brenda's good partner. They're still good friends. He's a good, solid, grounded man, very intelligent guy, musician as well. And many others that were key witnesses. Jenny Randalls just thought that he was a madman and wanted rid of him. So, yes, that, that was very bizarre. There's lots of these characters that seem to be attracted to certain cases. And as you say, Philip, it wasn't clear what he was up to because it's almost as if, as you say, he was trying to 
glean information from certain individuals and then sort of throw spanners in the works and move on to the next target. But I'm, I'm sure, as 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 we both know, he wouldn't be the first person to be going out there spreading disinformation, regardless of whichever case you tend to look at. Certain cases tend to attract more of them than others. And sometimes you're quite surprised how sometimes what could be considered insignificant cases have these individuals attached to them. It's peculiar that yes. maybe it's because of the notoriety of, of Rendlesham, but even in those early periods where it wasn't as, as well known as it certainly is 30 years later, 40 years later, that someone would have stumbled across that somehow, Philip, and been able to track everybody down that was involved in it. Because in those days, you know, other than the phone book, you'd very have a hard time trying to find anybody involved in it back in those days. Oh, yes, absolutely. I agree. I mean, we have to look at all angles with this. I mean, you know, we have to try and fathom out whether or not he was a spy that was deliberately intending to sabotage mm -hmm. or um, to sway um, Brenda away from what she was doing. Um, you know, w there are many angles that we can take with this. What is clear is that no one knows exactly what was going on with him. Um, and certainly, I mean, these levels of high strangeness, anyone would consider him just to be a, a, a fraud, a, a madman or a gifted uh, clairvoyant, you know, something like this. But Brenda saw him change. And of course, he then uh, uh, brought the three UFOs, uh, you know, above Ralph Noyes, and Ralph Noyes would not lie. He was a very grounded gentleman. And so we, we, we just don't know. But I think and feel that there is more to this, and it seems very strange that he turned up on the scene just after the book's publication. Um, and that is something that we have to take into account. Of course, the book wasn't doing very well because I, I remembered reading and I have a lot of the documentation that I will not release for personal reasons with regards to certain other researchers. Because with me, if someone asks that things are private, then they're kept private. I'm a man of my mm -hmm. word. But certainly with regards to the book, Jenny found it very difficult to get the book into bookshops. Of course, that's the job of the publisher. And so, you know, it, it just goes to show, doesn't it, that someone somewhere was adamant to sabotage the efforts of Sky Crash. But, of course, that, that all fell to the wayside when the book was published as paperback, because, of course, in paperback, um, they, the publishers generate a hell of a lot more copies mm. in circulation because it's cheaper in the long run than hardbacks. So I think and feel that with any case, not just Rendlesham, but with Skinwalker Ranch, with Bempton, uh, with these other primed areas, even in national forests in the, you know, in, in America, with all the levels of high strangeness that are covered up, you'll get these levels that come in of high strangeness that kind of like want to kind of mop things up and muck things up and make no transparency to the actual case itself. I do know that people have their own opinions of, of what happened on the night in 1980. Um, some people state that it was, um, you know, there's certain troops are getting their own back on the American troops, uh, the SS, because that they, you know, with with helium balloons and lights on them, and uh, another story that it was part of a satellite that was that crashed. Oh, <laughs> it goes on the Tubuli. Yes. Uh, also, the um, a Russian aircraft as yes. well too. The Colonel Charles Holt mentioned the bear. Um, so. It just seemed very strange that, you know, all of these these points are still unclear. But all I can do is speak from my own experience to state categorically that whatever happened to those men on the in, within and surrounding areas of, of the base of Bent Waters and in Rendlesham, it, it's bizarre because we also, in our own private investigations, had seen some very strange things, even to one point where we were being hassled by an, a, a helicopter, a huge helicopter that was hovering tree level. We used to have this quite a lot. It doesn't make us important, but it felt, felt like they were trying to flush us out. And where we were stationed, this was me and Susan on this particular occasion, we were in a type of uh, clearing, and the helicopter was coming very close down to the ground. You could see the pilots very clearly within the cockpit. They were facing us, and I thought, my God, I nearly, you know, 
cacked myself because I thought <laughs> they were going to land and come out and grab us. We didn't know what we'd done wrong. But there was light activity to the far left of the helicopter. It was very strange, and it wasn't the, um, you know, the Orfordness lighthouse with its beams. No, this was bright light. We were trying, me and Susan, to direct the troops with our hands to say, look, look to, to, to the to that area you've got to go that area no they didn't they just they just sat there hovering not far from the ground and then when the light stopped they went up and took off and you know even that case of the summoning of the ufo on the 8th of june 1998 which was spectacular incredible and that was in capel green the field i will never to this day understand what happened i all i can tell you is that we did our investigations um and it is very bizarre. And people will come up to me or they will say, oh, you know, that weird person, Philip Kinsella, he apparently allegedly summoned with Susan and Ronald a UFO through a psychic experiment and it worked. And uh, I can't believe it. It was actually military technology, holographic technology being used. And I'm like, well, hang on a minute. We are three relatively unimportant individuals in a field performing an experiment. Why on earth would the military waste their resources on yes. us to project a UFO, a triangular UFO with a, with a gap and a circular appendage above the tree, these huge trees, um, silent, moving uh, in one one way, the other, the other, with a blue bank of lights, a uh, set of uh, blue bank of lights beneath it, with light source emanating from the pyramidical type device above it, no sound. Why would they promote this? Why would they want to do this? I, I can, I wish somehow that there was some kind of machine that could, well, I don't think most people wish this, that could go into your mind and draw exactly what you saw out of it so you could see it. You would then understand that this was not military projection of holographic lights or, you know, whatever. So, you know, I remembered when the event happened, we were so stunned, we put all the material together, contacted UFO magazine, spoke to a man called Bream Forbes. I couldn't even pronounce or spell his name. It's weird because every time I asked for his name, the editor, he said, send it to me and I'll send it on to Peter Robbins. He didn't know at that point that I knew Peter Robbins. He did not know anything about that. And I thought, well, why would he want to send this information to him? Well, when I sent the information, we drew everything. We did the reports. We did everything, sent it to them. Didn't hear anything. I phoned them back again and I asked for the editor. And I can't remember which gentleman I spoke to, but he said, we don't have anyone here with that name. And that's not a conspiracy. That's e exactly what happened. So <laughs> someone somewhere has got that envelope with our report and drawings in them. And I'm just saying here for the record, if anyone knows where they are, could they please send them back to me? <laughs> Because I, that would categorically prove that that was done, but it was almost like a paper trail was dispersed and disappeared. So I don't know. I, I, I don't stand there and say, oh, you know, Grand Highness and, you know, all this type of thing, or you had the, no, it's just bizarre and absolutely strange how things panned out. I still have to pinch myself to say they actually <laughs> <laughs> But they yeah. did. I'm, I'm surprised we don't consider the term Rendlesham'd, Philip, because yes. it, it seems that quite a lot of people, whenever they, it doesn't matter how much they do on it, something will tend to happen that, that pulls them in. And, and as you mentioned, the, the SAS story was was oh, sent yeah. to David Clark. Dr. David Clark, oh yes, I've never met him, but I do admire yeah. his work. Uh, obviously a local luminary of, of, of Sheffield. He he very quickly was able to to kind of pull that story to pieces and and but he was saying it was very odd because that was left I think it was left in the university mailbox for him somebody hand delivered something oh. Philip oh gosh um, and he was like you know it's twenty years afterwards why on earth are they sending this to me you know obviously yeah. as you mentioned about what what happened with with the challenges Peter's faced um Brenda when she was doing this with the book obviously certain people have investigated yeah. it and come out of the other end with a completely different opinion of of anything that happened you've got you've yes. got the various stories of particular witnesses more people come forward with with several other aspects to it there are odd parts to this story that sometimes make you scratch when you think that you've decided upon an explanation something comes up as i've always said the whole situation with john burroughs and his medical treatment 
Oh, yes. Regardless, that is a matter of fact. Whether people might think it was an exaggeration, as they can accuse some of the other witnesses or some other aspects of the story, Philip, they can't yes. deny that they said Burroughs didn't serve there until they were forced to admit that he had. Which then makes you wonder, well, what on earth were they doing? Because when things like that start to happen, I think it just fuels the fire of everything else. Everybody else thinks, well, if they're lying about that, why should we believe them about everything else? Yes, well, they had the Office of Special Investigations going, you know, and, uh, of course, they, they tried to denounce the story. So whether or not it was some kind of military exercise, whether it was some kind of, um, you know, psychological experiment, whether it was UFOs coming from another dimension, we just don't know. But one of the things that we do know is that it was certainly not the lights from the Norfolk Hes- Norfolk Hes- Norfolk, I could never get that. Orfordness Lighthouse, I could never get that word <laughs> I'm glad out. you had that problem. I was, I'll let no, you do it, Philip. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, you know, because people, armchair, I'm sorry I've got to say this, there are armchair people out there who point a finger and criticise. Once you are in the nest of that activity, when you are actually there, it is a very different story altogether. And it's not because it's late and you're spooked. There was another occasion where... We had gone down to the gates of Bentwaters, a very long walk, I can assure you, from the track. And there's this smell of ammonia that always seemed to be present by the gates, which was re- a little bit off-putting. Mm. And we, we noticed this smell quite a number of times. Like, you know, that medical smell you get in the real stench of yeah. ammonia, that smell. Um, like a, it, it was also mixed with a kind of medical smell. And that always seemed to hang around that mm. area. We have no idea why. And then on this, on, on that occasion, when the three of us, um, my, Susan and Ronald, we were all together, there was this sound. And I mean, that, that just it was the most awful sound I've ever heard. And it was like a thump. And it came from the area of where the tree lining is directly. If we're looking back up away from the gates towards the forest, it was to our right. And it was a organic thump. as So something had heavy had just landed not far from where we were standing. We didn't see anything, but let me tell you, we started to walk very quickly away from that area. When you go into cases of like the national parks, we won't go into that because that will take all night. But when you go into the areas of, of uh, David Polite's missing 411 and you hear of these um, areas where UFOs are seen and, you know, dogma is seen, Sasquatch is seen or whatever – whatever abhorrent things that suddenly turn up or appear and then people disappear uh, on, on rare occasions through very strange circumstances, which the, uh, the establishments try to cover up through the, um, the, the forests, uh, the, the workers there um, that work, the forestry commissions uh, tend to, you know, not, not uh, highlight these mm. cases. Um, but that was, horrifying because we knew instinctively that that was something that wanted us to know that it was there and it's hard to explain in words because people then say oh it's because you would know when you are there in that situation that is a very different situation when you know you're you're experiencing this so again we don't know we know that there's something linked with the geographical location with certain weather experimentation occurred there, whether or not that upset the balance of nature and caused a rip somewhere in space and time, if we want to be a little bit more science fiction-y here, but is now becoming more of an open reality in terms of dimensions, portals, this type of thing. So, yeah, I, I have to say to you that, you know, it, it's bizarre. <laughs> that is, and, and, and still to this day, um, people have had health issues. Uh, some of the people have had psychological issues. Um, so you don't fare very well when you get involved in this. I mean, I've been okay. I mean, I haven't suffered anything. The only thing I suffered was through other people trying to direct me off it or try and make it as hard as possible to get information out there. <laughs> You know, so, yeah, that's my take yes. on it. Well, I was about to say, I think you've done very well out of it in regards to the fact that you <laughs> you seem to have survived mostly intact, Philip, you know, yes. without any kind yeah. of, as, as we refer to, some of the issues that everybody, you know, some of the more notable people involved in it. So I suppose 
when you look back at it, Philip, one would suggest that you're you're glad to be out the other end and, and it's behind you now. Yes, it is. I mean, I don't think I'll go back there anymore now, unless, of course, someone said, you know, we want to do this or that. I may think about it. I did go back there not long ago, um, I think probably about a couple of years ago, um, to do t- with some camera guys who wanted to do a little bit of filming there. And we were walking through the forest at night, uh, well, when it was getting late, talking about our experiences. And that's all we did was walk and talk. And uh, I prefer to have sat and spoken about it than getting out of breath. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm glad that it's behind me now. But I will tell you, I am honoured to have connected with Brenda Butler. I am honoured also to have met many of the people who had their experiences. I'm also grateful that I had the opportunity to go through Brenda's redundant manuscript, although I think she would have preferred the manuscript to be have been published in its entirety. But there was a lot of cases that were similar to one to the other. So, of course, as you know, when you're a writer, you have to make a book punchy. You need to make it, you know, Yes. There, uh, you know, with one obscene to another obscene and another obscene and the dates and times, it, it becomes re- re- uh, repetition. And the publishers didn't want that. They wanted something that was, uh, you know, fast and paced. So I took out the pieces that I thought that the general public would find interesting through her work. So have I failed in that? I think perhaps through the eyes of some people, yes. But I think it might be interesting for others to understand the importance of these levels of high strangeness. And, of course, Brenda's work and research into the forest and, of course, her documentation of those events that I was very honoured and privileged to look at. So when you, you know, people see a book and they say, oh, you know, Roswell, another Roswell book or whatever, don't be too harsh or another book on Rendlesham, you know, I think and feel when you get to know the individual and you, you know, the genuine individuals, the genuine researchers, the genuine, gen, genuine authors, when you find out more about the, the, the work behind the scenes, I think it's far more interesting. So that's why I wanted to write the book. And I was determined to get it published uh, because I felt that Brenda had a very important story to tell, even though sadly she hadn't had anything else published, as you quite rightfully said. And we know since the publication of uh, Sky Crash, A Cosmic Conspiracy in 1984. It's a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's certainly plenty of food for thought in it, Philip. There's there's plenty in there that's made me scratch my head. There's a couple of Things I was never aware of. I mean, I've never heard about this rocket on a truck witness before. Yes. Um, and, and obviously, as you, as we've mentioned, you know, one of numerous explanations as to what it could be. It's similarly to, to Roswell, there's about 23 different versions of what really happened, um, <laughs> depending on who you ask <laughs> yes. and what time of day it would Absolutely. often be. So, oh, God, yeah, it's a nightmare. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Oh, so before I let you go, I, and uh, thank you so much for for taking us through your experiences and and pulling the book together. I know you touched on your thank your you. next project, Philip. Could you could you yes. tantalise us with any kind of synopsis in regards to what you're working on and and when we can expect that? Yes, well, I I have a new book coming out from uh, Philip Mantel's Flying Disc Press called Terrestrial Trespassers. That deals with the greys, the abductions and areas of high strangeness. That covers also some new theoretical models or another piece to the model that I put together with regards to a possible theory. I've never put myself in a corner and said this is what it is because I'm open to all forms of speculation. But we have to be dangerous in looking outside the box. I am working on a new book, um, a UFO book. Um, there is a, uh, a another a very well-known UFO researcher who's helping me with that. Actually, I'm working on two books. So they're both UFOs, and one is with a, an American uh, top UFO researcher um, about the history of ufology and, of course, some uh, really uh, eye-opening cases, and another book that I'm working on my own that deals with uh, a lot more of these levels of high strangeness and to do with the cryptids as well. Although I'm not a cryptozoologist, I'm not an expert, uh, but who is at the end of the day? We're all uh, <laughs> we're all out there scrambling to try and find the truth and to dig up what we can and to find out what we can. And so, yeah, so I've got several other projects on the go. They're probably going to take a couple of years because this terrestrial trespassers took about a year and a half to write, but a, a little bit 
longer to research beforehand since you, the public deceived, the grandeur for deception came out. And then, of course, Philip republished Sky Crash, which had to be gone through again and to be uh, a little bit, you know, updated. Fabulous. Well, I look forward to that. Philip, where can everybody get hold of a copy of your work, including this one and any previous works, and also follow you online and keep up to date with what you're up to? Yes, well, the books are like any other book in the world. You can find them on Amazon. Of course, I think a lot of publishers now use Amazon um, because of uh, cutting back on expenditure. But you can find the book on Amazon, um, Sky Crash Throughout Time, as paperback, hardback, Kindle, and also audio. And uh, my new book, Terrestrial Trespassers, I'm, I think Philip might be bringing it out in the middle of this year, hopefully so, around the, is, is this year it's coming out. And that will be uh, done in the same format as well. And they can find uh, me and my twin brother on www thekinsellatwins.com so it's just thekinsellatwins.com the W's in front and the dot .com afterwards so that's where you can find me or on Facebook or social media uh, any of those outlets but I will say that I try to get back in touch with people but as you know yourself Paul sometimes <laughs> you've got quite a lot of correspondence to get through and people think oh you're ignoring me it's like <laughs> no <laughs> I, we're just all busy we're all busy we've got our own things to do you, I mean, life also happens you've got to live as well very true <laughs> very true Philip thank you so much for your time I look forward to uh, your next publication and hopefully we'll get a chance to uh, plan something in to chat about that down the line and I just want to say thank you so much for spending some time with me today. And I wish you the very best to you and Ronnie as always. Thank you very much indeed. I'm very honoured to come back on your show. It's, uh, it's a great privilege. Thank you very much, Paul. Mm -hmm.